Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We've been studying together in the first epistle to the Corinthians, verse by verse. And in our last study, we were in chapter 6. And I'd like to talk a little bit about the end of chapter 6. Um, there is a hope that I may be able to touch on the beginning of chapter 7 before May 14, which is a day that we're anxiously looking at for the return of our Lord. Maybe He'll return, maybe He won't. But that is our blessed hope. Christ is our blessed hope. We are members of His body, the church, and every sin that we commit outside the body is sin. But when we commit the fornication against the body, that is the body of Christ, in the church, then we sin against the church. And it's a serious thing to sin against the church. I touched on the fact that fornication has both a, a moral as well as a spiritual meaning in Paul's epistles. Uh, we know that it is wrong to be engaged with, to have an affair with, to have an illicit affair with someone other than that one who, uh, to whom God has joined us together with. But in the body of Christ, we've been joined together to another in the context of law versus grace. We've been joined, we've died to the law and we've been joined together to another that is Christ who was raised from the dead in whom we were raised with Him. And so to sin against the body of Christ is to commit the fornication, which is to have an endless affair with the law while being espoused to Christ. Every other sin, uh, the for any fornication that we commit outside the body is just that. It's outside the body. But there is the fornication, and this is how chapter 6 ends, which is consistent with the context that we saw early uh, on in a previous study, where that we have died to the law in order that we have been uh, might bear fruit unto God. More specifically, all things are lawful, but not all things are profitable. Not all things are expedient. Not all things are beneficial. I touched on this just a little bit. Uh, it's something that uh, is worthy of a lot of a d discussion. Uh, dearly beloved, we've been made the righteousness of God in Christ. The new man cannot become any more righteous by what it does, and we're certainly not in an affair with the law. Our relationship with God under grace is, is one of grace, not law. Uh, trying to keep the law is not going to make the new man any more righteous than what it already is. We've been made the righteousness of God in Christ. We stand before Him holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in His sight. And what I find so interesting about that is that when He returns for us and we're caught up in the air to meet the Lord in the air, we will be rid of these bodies of sin and death. Our bodies will be changed like unto His we will stand before Him holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in His sight because He died in our place, because we've been made the righteousness of God in Christ, because we've been clothed with the righteousness of Christ, because we put off the old man and we put on the new man. That is true of us now. And when we're caught up together with Him, the only thing that's going to change is that we'll have a new body like His and we'll be will be rid of this body once and for all. This body that, as we see in Romans 7, as we saw in Romans 7, is just a con constant, never-ending struggle, a contest, a conflict between the flesh and the Spirit. The flesh profits nothing. If you're living under law, if you've lived under, under law your entire life as a Christian, I want you to take heart. I want you to take note and be comforted and encouraged by the fact that God has nothing against you. Dearly beloved, He loves you. He died in your place. He doesn't love you anymore because you perform any better. He doesn't love you anymore 
today than he, than he did before he created the, laid the foundations of the earth, before he created you in Christ before the foundation of the, of the world. He chose you in Christ before the foundation of the world. You came to accept Him as your Lord and Savior at some point in your life without ever realizing that you were always His child, that you were never apart from Him, that He always had your best interests at heart. He was always directing your, your steps, that nothing touched your life except it be for your ultimate good. This is the God that we serve. This is the God that we worship. Unto Him be all the glory now and forever. Amen. The flesh profits nothing. You can't ever please God in the flesh. This is why we see in Galatians, we were crucified with Christ. We were buried in Romans, buried, Romans 6, buried with Him through baptism into death so that just as Christ was raised from the dead, we too might walk in newness of life, His life. The law came through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. I have lived and walked on this earth as a believer in Christ for going on 35 years, and my burden, dearly beloved, every single day and night of that time that I've been here has been for God's people, <clears throat> not the lost, not, not, not the lost in the sense that, that, that somehow, if, if somehow the non-believing element of the world would somehow, somehow turn over a new leaf and, and, and do, do what's right and, and pleasing in God's sight, that they would become His children. Dearly beloved, God came into the world to save His people from their sins. His people, and He will do that. He has done that. He's always done that. He will do that. He, not one of His sheep will be lost. My burden has always been, Paul's burden, your burden ought to be for the lost. Okay? And that includes the lost sheep of the house of Israel. We love Israel. We pray for Israel. We know that God will bring them back into a relationship with with Himself, that they were set aside for unbelief so that the, so that you could be saved so that the times of the Gentiles could be fulfilled, that salvation would come to, to you and to I. And now we live in an age, the dispensation of grace, the wonderful dispensation of grace, in which God has, is not even imputing men's trespasses against them. If you are God's child, if you have at least one ounce a belief in your heart that you are God's child, then you need to know and understand and be comforted by the fact that Christ's work in your life was applied. It's not that it's you have to apply it. It's not that, it, well, what is true of one is not true of another. We are members of His body. We are all members of His body. We stand before Him blameless, spotless, without spot. This is how you need to go and meet the Lord, whether it's at the rapture or whether He takes you home through natural causes. Do not, dearly beloved, do not go and meet the Lord who died in your place, who made you the righteousness of God in Christ. Not having the assurance, not ha ever having known the blessing of, of all that He said is true of us, that we've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies in Christ. The day of, our, of His return, His coming back for us is drawing more near by the day. And of course, we are to occupy until He comes. We're to go about our daily lives as if He may not come in our lives, in our lifetime. I believe He will. Many believe He will. Many believe He won't. The point here, the most, the vital point here is that in all of these doctrinal epistles of Paul, of Paul's, Paul's epistles, which were not written by Paul, but were written by God, Paul was simply the tool in God's hand to complete the Word of God. 
All of these doctrinal epistles, 13 doctrinal epistles, they are the very lifeblood of the church. And few Christians today spend much time in these epistles at all. They spend most of their time in the synoptic gospels or in the Old Testament, and they never come to realize who they are in Christ, how much they've been blessed in Christ, how that they're not coming behind, lacking in no spiritual gift, no spiritual grace. The word there is grace. We saw it in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 7. These Corinthians, which many of them we wouldn't have wanted to hang out with, this church at Corinth, why did God choose this particular church and then, and then shower such blessings upon them? One of the most corrupt, one of the most I, I don't know what word to use. Some would call it despicable. Some would call it just filthy. Carnal. Fleshly. But they were not Fleshly, they were living fleshly. They were not carnal, they were living carnally. They were not... I wish that somehow people would just take the time to slow down and, and go through Paul's epistles and look at the tremendous number, the tremendous amount of blessing that God has, has bestowed upon us as His church, His people today. We are living, folks, in a very unique period in history, the age of grace, the dispensation of grace, in which God is not even imputing men's trespasses against them. Do you know, dearly beloved, that you stand before God without fault, without blame, spotless, holy, righteous, made the righteousness of God in Christ? Do you know that? We know this because God said it. That's it. The, our, your problem is not that, you, that you're coming behind or lacking in any spiritual grace. Your, if your problem, if any, is that you are not believing that God said that. There is nothing that you could possibly do to make yourselves more complete in Christ, to make yourselves more approved by God, to make God love you more than what He already does or has. What we are looking at in this study is dealing the Holy Spirit through Paul in the church at Corinth, dealing with them in the matter of law and grace. The subject is law versus grace. I know you don't see that just plastered all over the text. But dearly beloved, that is the subject that's being dealt with. The reason the, the law is the strength of sin. Why were these believers at Corinth living the way that they were? The law is the strength of sin. The power of sin. The strength of sin is the law. Why is that? You would think it would be the opposite. Because Christ is the fulfillment of the law for everyone who believes. The law came through Moses. Grace and truth come through Jesus Christ. Christ said you search the Scriptures daily. For you think that in them that you have life, but you will not. You're unwilling to come unto Me that you may have life. We know that God gave us life and that more abundantly. We know that. And yet, we scratch our heads and we, we, we wonder, you know, well, is that really true? Is that really true of me? Is it that hard for you to wrap your mind around the fact that what is true of me is true of you? And what is true of you is true of me? Is it really hard for you to wrap your mind around the fact that we are children? We're, we're children of God. We're related to one another. You're my brother. You're my sister. We are all children of God. We are, and He did not produce corrupt offspring, folks. We saw that in 1 John. His seed abides in us. We cannot sin because why? Because we've been born of God. 
and we were born of God, not by our own will, not by our own emotions, not by our own decision, not, by, not through some performance on our part, some act or action on our part. We were born again from above by God at His timing, even at His timing. The, the very timing of your new birth was determined and decreed by God before He ever created this world. But no, no, no. We, we have to think in terms of, 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 of human uh, performance and human merit and, and man's sovereign uh, determined will and so on and so forth. You were not born again by your own will. I don't care, dearly beloved, what a million preachers out there tell you. You were not born again from above by God by some decision you made. John 1.13 says you were not. Now you can believe God or you cannot. It's, up, it's completely up to you what, you what you believe. And I don't ask anyone to believe anything I believe. But I will tell you what the text says. I've said this repeatedly over and over in hundreds of video videos that you are born again by the will of God, not the will of the flesh. I'm re just repeating what God said. You can believe God or you cannot, but you don't have any argue with, argument with me. Your argument, if you have one, is with God. And folks, I'm not going to argue with God. He says that you're righteous. He says you're not the unrighteous that will not inherit the kingdom of God. Such were some of you, but you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Justification, folks, by faith, is not you're, made just, you're not justified, that is, made righteous by some act of faith on your part, but by the faithfulness of God who loved you and gave His life for you. We don't nullify the grace of God, for if any righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died for nothing. His death, death was needless. Okay? We didn't need Christ. Okay? If righteousness came through the law, through human merit, through the function of human merit or human performance, we did not need a cross. We didn't need a Calvary. We didn't need Golgotha. We didn't need a Garden of Gethsemane. We didn't need the Christ at all. Okay? We didn't need it. We didn't need Him. God sent His Son into the world to show that He loved His people, that He died in their place, It's not, we're not like Israel. There were, Israel was given the law. God said that Israel did nothing of what, they, what He commanded them to do. Nothing at all. You'd think, well, they must have done something. They must have done a little bit. Well, he did a li they, Israel did a little bit of what I told them to do. No, they did nothing of what He told them to do. Looked at in the, in the larger picture, Israel failed. They failed. Why? Because they did not trust God. They did not believe God. They thought that the righteousness came through the law, and the very author, the human author of this epistle, as well as the rest of the 13 epistles, had every right as a Jew of Jew, a Hebrew of Hebrews, a Pharisee of Pharisees, to say what he did about righteousness and the law. In Philippians chapter 3 that I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. The out-resurrection of the dead. Very unique word used in all the New Testament. It's only found once. It speaks of our being raised with Christ and walking in newness of life. His life, not our own. His work, not our own. What shall we do to do the works of God? Believe in Him whom He has sent. It is right, the righteousness that's based on faith. We saw that in Romans. It is a righteousness that's based on faith. The faithfulness of God in Christ. His work was sufficient. There's, there's nothing that Christ did that He didn't... It's not that he, that he did all this stuff and He left some of it up to you to finish. Okay? 
on the cross, he cried out, it's, it, when he cried out, it's finished, he meant just that, it was finished. There's nothing that you can add to or take away from the finished work of Christ. It was applied to every single believer's life, including yours and mine, as well as these Corinthians there at Corinth. We know we walk by faith, not by sight. If you walk by sight, that's just exactly how you're going to sound. That's, that's exactly how you're going to feel. Well, I know that may be true of Billy Graham, and I know that may be true of, of Pastor Steve, and I know that may be true of my grandpa, but that cannot be true of me. The only reason you would say that is, is that you're looking, you're not looking at Christ. You're not fastened. You haven't fastened your attention, your focus on Christ. Your focus is on yourself. Yourself. And what you must do to either inherit the kingdom of God, to, to either attain righteousness or maintain righteousness on a human level. Oh, but Steve, what about the word, you know, all the words, you know, the commands given us in Scripture? You, you know, we're not under law, but we're, you can't tell me that we're not told to do this and, and this and that and the other thing. That's true. That's true. Of course. How else could God have, have, have how, how else could He have revealed His own character, His own righteousness, His own, His own perfect, sinless nature? His own will. How, how else could He have revealed that unless He commanded us to do certain things? But at the same time, He says you're not under law, but you're under grace. Do you understand what I'm saying, dearly beloved? It's not a contradiction. It's that if we didn't have all those commands in Scripture, we wouldn't have the picture, the lovely portrait of our Lord that we do. When I open my Bible and I look at, at, at thou shalt not do this or thou shalt do this, when I look at, at the imperative moods and the grammar, when I look at, at all the commands that were given us, and, and, I, and by the way, as a reminder, the first command given us is in Romans 6.11, reckon yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God in Christ Jesus. You would think that, that the first command that God would give would be, now look, I want all y'all to believe. That's not what the command was. The first command was reckon yourselves to be dead. Indeed, uh, well, Steve, I've tried to do that. I've tried to reckon. I've reckoned till I blew. I'm blue in the face. It didn't work for me. But what do you mean it didn't work for you? Well, what are you trying to do? Well, I'm, I'm just. I'm trying to rec reckon myself dead to sin. I, I, you know, but I didn't stop sinning. The idea being that it, that, where the you know the person thought that by reckoning that that was going to somehow you know take and, and eradicate the old man the flesh it's not we don't reckon be, just to, to stop sinning we reckon because we do sin dearly beloved the old man that's all it does that's all it ever will do look at the old man and all of all of its sin all of that sin that ugliness that flesh Look at that as everything below the surface of the of, of the of the ocean. Okay? It's 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 there, it's 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 always gonna be there. But everything above there, that surface, is your new man. Okay? And the new man cannot sin. It cannot, it doesn't have the power, it doesn't have the ability to sin. We need to learn to function out of the new man. Well, how do we do that? By faith. By faith. By believing God that what He said about us is true. How much as a Christian, in your life as a Christian, have you come to understand what is true of you in Christ? You would think that the first thing that a Christian would want to know when he becomes a Christian is who he is. His identity. He now has a new identity. What is that identity? You would think that that that's, would be the, the desire of every Christian. In fact, I think it is to some degree. 
But then it's, it's not long before others began to heap responsibilities upon you that God never equipped nor intended that you bear. And before you knew it, you were fully back under the dominion of the law, which serves no purpose in your life except to drive you to Christ. It robs you of your peace, of your joy. You know how it feels to, to not feel accepted even on a human level. Imagine millions of Christians that don't believe that God accepts them, that they don't stand before God holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in His sight. Will all of this make a difference once we are caught up in the air to meet the Lord, and so shall we ever be with the Lord? Will it matter? Does it matter how we live now? Well, of course it does. Don't, don't talk to me about, well, I don't, I don't care about rewards, Steve. I'm not interested in rewards. I'm just, I'll, be just, I'll just be glad to make it to heaven. I don't, I'm not interested in any crowns, any special kind of recognition or reward. And that sounds kind of, you know, I guess, you know, there, there's a sense of humility in that expression. But if you don't care what God wants, I don't understand that. God desires that you have that crown to cast at His feet. Now, you may not care about that now, but you will later. Everything that you are, everything that you think, everything that you believe, your theological position, the, the, the beliefs that you hold to be true, all of that which has settled down deep within your heart, dearly beloved, that is the only thing that you're going to take to heaven with you. Not your boots, not your hat, nothing else but that. Okay? You will not leave that behind. We will all stand before Him and give an account for how we lived and how we built on the foundation, the one foundation that was Jesus Christ, not build, built upon some foundation, other foundation that we laid that was basically ourselves. And, and, and all we did was build upon our own self-performance and self-merit. I love you all. I truly do. I always have. I have prayed for you all constantly, day and night. I have worked tirelessly. I have labored endlessly to try to, to at least make some impression upon you people that, that you are not being told the truth about who you are in Christ in the main. We are living in an age of deception in which the truth has been turned upside down in every spectrum, in every, every area that you could possibly imagine whether it's political, whether it's, it's ecclesiastical. We are living in the age of deception. There will come a time of great apostasy. I believe that we are living right now in an age in which the light of the true gospel, the, is, the flame is flickering, it's about to burn out. Because most Christians today believe, still believe, somehow down deep in their heart, there's still that, that hideous idea that we're saved somehow by what we do. And folks, that is not the truth. It never has been. And, and my prayer for you is that you would increasingly come to know Him as, as the Lord of, of your life as He is. You don't make Him Lord. Folks, He's Lord of your life whether you make Him Lord of your life or not. We're going home soon. I hope to put out a, a few more videos before May 14. I'm not sure if I can. Just know that you are loved by us, all, all of us here at Blessed Hope Forever. I thank you all for your continued prayers. You have helped us so much. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.